for me, it's always been about aligning myself or becoming close to people that I always admired or had traits that I admire. And, mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to both grandfathers, like finding one grandfather that was really great at business and talking to him all the time, strictly about business. My personal relationship with him wasn't as close as my other grandfather, who I really admired how he treated his family and friends. And he was hilarious. He was so funny. And people looked up to him and loved him and just loved mm -hmm. being around him. And I wanted to be like both of them. I wanted to be somebody that people liked and somebody that, you know, people looked at and said, he's a great family guy. He's a great father. He's a great husband. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, the other grandfather of looking at me and saying, he treats his employees right. He takes care of his clients and he's somebody in the business world that I want to be like. And, you know, throughout the years, I've met quite a few people that I, I taken some of that from and I, and I admire and, mm -hmm. You know, I try to try to get close to them. That's really why I brought, I really wanted to partner with John because John is that guy. John is a great family guy. John is a guy that cares about product. Um, and he, and he's, he fills voids where I'm not necessarily great at. You know, I come from the business development background. That's all about need another sale. We're going to lose this. We're only as good as our last sale. We need to hurry yeah. up and grow, grow, grow. And John is slow down the process. We need to make sure if we're putting out product, it's the right product. It's beautiful product. He was actually the one that challenged us to become a certified B corporation, making sure that you know, we talk a big game, but we really need to back it up by being, you know, socially responsible and really proving it with the, the corporate and social governance that B Corp certification is. But not only that, it's not a lifetime certification. It's an every three year thing. So yeah, oh, yeah, I know it's a long way of saying it's, it's aligning myself with people that I look up to. And I've had other people over the, the, the life that I looked up to that, you know, you go on a work trip with, with people and that's when you really get to know them and you see how they interact with um, people of the other sex and, and they're married and wearing wedding bands yeah. and things like that. And it, it's something that you, you've got to look at because the world of your reputation matters, matters more now than ever. Obviously yeah. I'm on a podcast with you right now and hopefully lots of people will see this, but there's Instagram, there's LinkedIn, there's all of these media channels and all it takes is for you to align yourself with the wrong guy or girl for everybody to realize that, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're probably not who they think they are. And I, I want to make sure that the people that I associate with in my friends group and, and work life are, are those, those people that people always look up to. So, you know, I had a, actually a good childhood when I grew up in, uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, I live in New York for the past, I don't know, 19 years at this point, but um, Charleston was a good place to, to grow up. I came home every day and my mom, she, uh, she worked as a, as a school teacher in college, but always made sure to get home by like 3.30 or 4 when we got home. And every night had dinner on the table, which was crazy. I don't yeah. know how she did it. Um, at this point, now that I'm a parent, it seems like an impossible feat. But um, she, she did an amazing job making sure that we're all around the dinner table every night, uh, catching up. So, yeah, it was and, great. And did you have siblings too? I have an older brother um, who's close in age, about 18 months, and a younger sister who's like nine years younger. So yeah, yeah. it's like having a sister and a daughter all in one because we take good care of her. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very cool. Though. Yeah, we're, we're all pretty close. Very, very cool. Now, did, you, did you have entrepreneurial tendencies growing up? Were you, you know, did you uh, sell candy or gum or anything like that at school or, or anything along those lines? Yes. I think, I don't even know how I got the bug. I had two, two grandfathers that I was lucky enough to have until I was in my late teen years. Both I looked up to in different ways. One was on the business side who owned about 13 pharmacies in South Carolina. Wow. And the other was a physical ed teacher in New York who was just the most generous and loving guy in the world. And, you know, I tried to take a little bit of pieces from each of them, but the, the entrepreneurial bug was always, always in me. Uh, always reading books growing up or skimming through them because I wasn't a great reader, but mm -hmm. Rich Dad, Poor Dad was one of those first books that I picked up for Robert Kiyosaki. And, you know, just uh, had the bug and wanted to, you know, be the best at selling candy bars at school. And then, you know, uh, a buddy of mine and I, we sold snow cones downtown Charleston during Spoleto Festival at 14, <laughs> where our, our dad was generous enough to, go to Costco and buy the ice and all of the mix that we needed. And so yeah. we, 
at a nice hundred percent gross profit margin at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> it was, it no, was no pretty profit nice. sharing or anything. You, you didn't. Uh, uh, you didn't... <laughs> I feel like I owe him a few bucks, but we'll, we'll talk about great. that another that's time. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the what was the uh, event or the the uh, Sp- Spiodo? It was. Uh, it's called the Spiledo Festival. Spiledo. You know, Charleston brings a lot of people all the time to to visit, but the Spiledo Festival happens in. Usually in May, it's a great artistic fair and ah. uh, downtown Charleston buzzing with people and tourists and tourists willing to spend six dollars on a snow cone that had probably about 20 cent cogs uh, yeah. at the time, <laughs> willing to pay that that, that three dollar water as as I'm sure you would you would also if you go to Charleston. And, and I think you were just there and yep. realize how hot it is that uh, any amount of money that whatever it costs they'll pay for that crystal geyser costco water <laughs> exactly yeah. yep yeah yeah beautiful city though absolutely amazing yeah. love beautiful love city beautiful um, city. so what, what drew you up to new york you, you've been to, to new york for or you've been in new york for quite a while now so what yeah. uh what brought you yeah there? i graduated college all the way like 2005 i went to indiana um i went into school for communications it just felt like um uh, if you want to go into business, like it's great taking business courses, but you know, there's, there's much smarter guys and girls out there than I. So, you know, hire the smartest finance people you can find and hire people that maybe you aren't going to get A's and B's even. And I was a C-level student in some of those finance and the economic courses. So I wanted to do something that I genuinely liked and had flexibility and communication courses is all about presentation skills and, you know, more creative thought. So I wanted to major in that and um, straight out of school, uh, I was lucky enough to have family friends that owned a really successful recruiting business that focused on accounting and finance professionals. Again, I didn't know anything about what it meant to be a financial accountant or a CFO at the time. And I was 21 years old coming out of school, but I really, I really had a, a passion for sales. And I liked the idea of selling a candidate on why he or she should take a job and selling a massive company like Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns, why I'm a great person to fill that job. And so when you're 21 coming out of school in 2005, it was like the heyday for financials. You know, yeah. it's like a lot of money, just like it seems like today, but um, it's placing like CFOs at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and director of accounting policy. And it was a great three year run in New York City, but then 2008 came crashing down and yeah. Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are all my uh, clients at the time. And uh, it was it was definitely a challenging time after um, getting lucky out of school and, and having so much success so early on. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, was, so, was, so you're you're in New York now, 2008. And and, you know, obviously pretty well, all of your your customers pretty well blew up, basically. You know, they 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 weren't really offering or asking for your services that much anymore. Would you would you do next? It was definitely challenging. I always looked, I mean, I always looked for people in my life that I could look up to, but were more successful than I was. So I always wanted to know, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing to make so much money? How are you doing this? And weeding through like, who's actually just, you know, buying big tables and spending a lot of money on alcohol, but actually has no money, but are actually finding out who the successful people are. And I came across uh, a, a friend of mine who was in insurance and um, insurance is a flexible business. You can do both. And the recruiting firm at the time was like, you can do both. I'll let you be a recruiter here when you can, and you can go sell insurance to some of your clients at the time. And just kind of juggled a few different jobs. Um, but it was, it was still one of those things where you were a 1099 employee going through 2008 to 2010. I racked up a serious amount of debt. Um, mm-hmm. living in New York city, it's expensive. And I had a yeah. lifestyle from 21 to 24 where I was making six figures out of college. I didn't care. I just spent money as if like I was still making it. Yeah. I racked up maybe like $50,000 between credit card debt and taxes owed to the government at that time. And, um, it was, it was very tough. I, I, I remember calling my family back at home in Charleston and being like, I think I'm in a lot of trouble. I owe like $50,000. Mm-hmm. I don't make a hundred thousand dollars at all anymore. Um, how the hell am I ever going to do this? And, you know, speaking to my dad, speaking to my mom, uh, they, they, they made some suggestions. It was all about like, why don't you come home for a little bit, move back to Charleston, move back in with us. Why don't you go get a job working as a barista? And I'm like, uh, that's, that's all really great advice. Really appreciate it. But 
I still want to be like successful. I, I still want to get there and, and I, I feel like I can, I just need to figure it out. Um, so my grandmother uh, was very nice and, and gave me a little bit of a loan, um, which, I, which I paid back, but uh, a loan to cover just monthly expenses for a few months so that I could figure it out and still stay in New York and not have to move home. Yeah. And I created a company. I have a recruiting background. I just whipped up a website really quick called, um, I think it was called Cohen City Consultants. I made a big website where it seemed like I had a lot of people on my team and reached out to a few of those contacts that I had from over the years and asked people, you know what, I see you have an opening online. You're looking for a, um, a director of acquisitions for a real estate company at the time. And they were paying $150,000 for that salary. I said, you're, you're probably paying a recruiter 25%. Just pay me 18% and I'll fill that job. Yeah. And yeah. luckily I got a few of those and I filled a few. And within a few months, I think I, I made about 50 or $60,000, not enough to pay off the taxes and the um, credit card debt I had, but a good head start. Yeah. But yeah. then I needed to do something else full time. And I, I, another friend of mine at the time was working in 2010. I always came back to New York from LA. And I said, what do you do? And he's like, I sell water bottles and t-shirts for a living. I'm like, that sounds terrible, um, <laughs> but you seem really successful. And he explained to me, there is this whole world out there of enterprise companies that actually buy a lot of merchandise, with t-shirts and water bottles and pens. And they have big budgets for this, that they're giving yeah. out to reward employees or loyalty gifts. He's like, why don't you come work with me? I'm opening up a New York office. We'll you know, do this together. I'll teach you the ropes. And then I went there in um, 2010, took a very big salary cut, almost basically worked for free, but I had upside in commission. And for the first six months, I didn't make a dollar. Like mm -hmm. I did not, I was, I was, no, I was working hard. I had a lot of outbound emails had a lot of phone conversations, but I made zero dollars for six months, but he told me to keep believing in it. And and, and on that six month, I remember getting a phone call from this uh, rebranding agency it was rebranding Humana, the insurance company at the time. Mm -hmm. It was based in Kentucky. They were, uh, they needed merchandise for every employee and an investor. And, and from there, I, I had a really, uh, a really nice commission check in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I haven't looked back ever since. Uh, so it was my entree into this, this merch world, the retail yeah. world yeah. that we're in and now. And that's, and that's where you, obviously you started Harper and Scott at, at, at a certain point. Um, yeah. Did you, how long did you work with that friend or at that company before you started off your own, your own thing? I was there from about 2010 to 2014. Um, they were a great, great company uh, while I was there. I was definitely um, in the top of the business development associates that, that were working there. There were some, some challenges with them wanting to exit, which they eventually did, and me not even owning a sliver of equity at yeah. the same time that I was felt like I felt like I was owed a little bit, uh, obviously helping drive revenue. And it could be argued either way. They, uh, they're a great company, and, and they, did a, they, did a, they did a great job exiting. Um, they, they definitely compensated fairly. So I felt, you know, now looking back, it, it, was, it was okay. But um, I, I always saw that there was a little bit of, um, our, I guess this industry that we're in is still pretty archaic. And um, there was a lot of opportunities for change. Mm -hmm. the, the promotional product business has been around for about 50 plus years. There's 20,000 companies selling t-shirts, water bottles, pens, and notebooks and things like that. But they're all selling the same crap. It's yeah. all the same stuff over and over again with just a different logo on it. And if we could just come at this from a more creative angle, produce a better user experience by actually being responsive and transparent, that I think we can really make a difference in this space and, and grow rather quickly. And so I partnered with a, a really good friend of mine who um, has a technology background, which is all about the user experience. I came to him and I said, John, I wanna start my own company. I already have a name called Harper and Scott. It's my wife's middle name. It's my middle name. It looks like, like a, a branding agency, the way that we're going to spell it out. And I want you to be my partner because I need your help. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's no way I'm going to sell t-shirts and water bottles with you. I'm sorry, but I'm happy to help you. And then I took the experience that my friend had about five years ago, convincing me to go into it. And over the course of a few weeks, um, finally convinced John that so this is the right board. way to do it. Yeah. yeah, we started in 2014. 
Very cool. So, so it was just the two of you when you started and, and your wife, or is your wife involved too? Or No, she wasn't involved. She just had a really great name. So yeah, you know, from, from that point, and she was, she was obviously very supportive from the beginning. Luckily, uh, we didn't have kids at the time, but she was super supportive and you know, always has been extremely supportive um, in, in all these crazy ideas that I have. But um, it was just myself and John. We were working out of the Refinery29 offices downtown New York. Um, I think they were giving us free desk or whatever it was. And we hired um, an intern who worked for free, but eventually we brought on full time. And now to that, the three of us, we kept growing and, and growing. And now we have about 62 employees in the U.S. And, you know, uh, had some had some really great experiences over the year of, of growing organically within clients like Sephora and Netflix and mm-hmm. some of these other great, great businesses. But um, transitioning throughout, not really pivoting, but just creating different revenue streams with the core business, which has always been fun for us. So. So, so I, I'm curious how you got into some of those, some of those larger companies, but first, you know, so you started this company and you obviously had a background in, you know, the, uh, the, the promotional product industry. Did you already have connections and, and established relationships with the products that you were looking to brand and, and promote, or you said that you were trying to, you wanted to be, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, new age and, and, uh, did you did you have to go out and find and source these new products that you ultimately ended up finding? Yeah, there's with? so there's two parts. I mean, when you start your own business after being at a company for so long, there's obviously contracts in place that prevent you from taking anything with you. And so, yeah. you know, I really had to start all over again, and and I, I just felt confident that we can we can do this. Um, there's a lot of suppliers in this ASI world, the Advertising Specialty Institute. That's about I don't know, 3,000 suppliers that supply the whole space domestically. But if you have connections in China, which I have really great relationships over there, and you know, my partner John knows some people over there that we've met over the years, um, you can build a creative team where you're taking a domestic stock item, like a really nice water bottle, mm-hmm. but the way that you create the imprint method or, or wrap the bottle or package it in a unique way so it feels like you're giving somebody a gift versus a promotional product. Mm-hmm. It just gives it a higher perceived value, even though it's the exact same product and the exact same cost. Um, yeah. It makes it it makes it just a little bit more special. And then when we have that team overseas that we're working with uh, the different trading companies, it's all about um, how can we have as much transparency into the manufacturing process as possible, so that nobody's waiting ninety days for anything anymore. You can yeah. get something super quick. You don't have to order hundreds of thousands of units. You could order 250 tote bags and we could get it to you really, really quick. Um, you know, just a simple tote bag rather than having like somebody else's label in it, it could have your label in it and it could be mm-hmm. something unique to your brand. Um, the hat that I'm wearing, for instance, if you take off the hat and you look in the inside, it could say Harper and Scott on the inside with the Harper yeah. and Scott logo here. Again, same price that you're buying maybe a Yupong hat for, yep. but now it's your own brand. Um, and then getting into some of these companies, obviously, as you brought up, was definitely challenging because nobody knows who we are. Right, um, right. They already have these relationships. <laughs> but um, we always thought that we would go after low-hanging fruit at companies that are having a lot of M&A, uh, a lot of transactions, a lot of money. And in the beauty space in 2014 to 2015, even now, I mean, it's still a lot of beauty space M&A. Mm-hmm. But Sephora happened to be on like the corner where our office was. Okay. We're like, if we get Sephora, if we could do anything with Sephora, we could use that as like, hey, we work with Sephora, we should work with you too. Yeah. And uh, we got in touch with the events team at Sephora. They said they were under contract with another agency for many years. It's another two or three years until that's up, but they're not seeing any innovative products. If we can do something, at least we do like 500 units for a new store opening on 60th and Lexington. Mm -hmm. So we created this, um, it was a, uh, custom shaped lipstick USB. They ordered 500 units. It was a three thousand oh, dollar total order. Yeah. And from there, we put you know Sephora and some of our emails. Hey, we work with Sephora. You know, we just helped them with this and started working with a lot more beauty companies than in the space. But over the years, um, using that model of get the low hanging fruit but grow organically within the client. Mm-hmm. Since 2017, Harper and Scott's been the exclusive provider um, for all of the merch. Uh, that Sephora does for a lot of their loyalty programs and wow. events. And 
Uh, it's all about just really feeling like we're, and it's cheesy to say, but really an extension of their team and we're building teams internally around them. So they feel like, and it's true, we are like treating them as if they're our only client, Yeah. Uh, whatever they need, big or small. They give us 10, 10 water bottles that they need for a VIP conference. They're going to feel the exact same customer service with 10 water bottles they do with if they order 10,000. Yeah. It's not about just one opportunity. It's about the whole relationship. And um, we're lucky enough that they've renewed that contract a few times since, since we started working with them. Yeah, that's great. That's great. What would you say your, you know, you, you obviously have made connections and that that's, you know, that, that goes above and beyond all of the products. Obviously the pr products have to be good, but you know, you had to make that initial connection with people. Do you have any insights or, or things that you've realized about yourself or the way that you present yourself that, you know, sort of make you stand out in other people's minds, would you say? I, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's me or if this is answering the right question, but I mean, for me, it's always been about aligning myself or becoming close to people that I always admired or had traits that I admire. And, mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to both grandfathers, like finding one grandfather was really great at business and talking to him all the time, strictly about business. My personal relationship with him wasn't as close as my other grandfather, who I really admired how he treated his family and friends. And he was hilarious. He was so funny. And people looked up to him and loved him and just loved being around him. And I wanted to be like both of them. I wanted to be somebody that people liked and somebody that, you know, people looked at and said, he's a great family guy. He's a great father. He's a great husband. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, the other grandfather of looking at me and saying he treats his employees right. He takes care of his clients and he's somebody in the business world that I want to be like. And, you know, throughout the years, I've met quite a few people th that I, I taken some of that from and I, and I admire and, mm -hmm. you know, I try to try to get close to them. That's really why I brought I really wanted to partner with John because John is that guy. John is a great family guy. John is a guy that cares about product um, and, he, and he's, he fills voids where I'm not necessarily great at. You know, I come from the business development background. That's all about need another sale. We're going to lose this. We're only as good as our last sale. We need to hurry yeah. up and grow, grow, grow. And John is slow down the process. We need to make sure if we're putting out product, it's the right product. It's beautiful product. He was actually the one that challenged us to become a certified B corporation, making sure that and we talk a big game, but we really need to back it up by being, you know, socially responsible and really proving it with the, the corporate and social governance that B Corp certification is. But not only that, it's not a lifetime certification. It's an every three year thing. So, yeah, oh, you, I know it's a long way of saying it's, it's aligning myself with people that I look up to. Yeah, I didn't realize you had to get recertified every three years for that. It's actually that. one of the best things that I like about B Corp is that they they don't give you the certification and say, this is a forever contract. Yeah. They say, this is a contract. And and by the way, it's, it's nobody gets a hundred, right? It's not like, okay, you're an amazing company. You got this. It's your score is X. Once you get over a certain number, then you get B Corp certified, but they give you goals to achieve a higher score. I and mean, you could do that throughout the year, but it yeah. really prepares you for the next three years when you do get recertified to hopefully continue just to improve. And yeah. that's what B Corp really cares about is just, a lot of these terms, sustainability, social responsibility, they haven't been around that long. Um, and people are starting to care more and more. Gen Z cares more yeah, about this than anything. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, educating our clients and becoming educated ourselves to be able to give somebody a tote bag that's not just RPET fabric, but actually says like, this is recycled material. It actually comes from water bottles in some cases that were found in the ocean. And and um, you know, making sure that people actually feel good about what they're receiving. Yeah. If we're, yeah. yeah. I love so that. I love a, that. It's interesting. So, so you you touched on something earlier when you were when you were telling your story about you know what 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 drove you and and you know sort of the inspirations that that uh, that you've taken from your childhood and, and kind of, you know, rolled that into life. And I, I couldn't agree more. It's, and it's actually one of the uh, things that I think I messed up on. And I'm just curious to see your perspective on this, but my, my past, I, I, uh, I followed someone's advice for about 10 years or so without really truly knowing how successful they, they were. I mean, they, they, 
you know, they, they talked to big game and they, they, you know, were very ostentatious with everything around them and that, but then when you, I really, and it took years to be able to do this, but when you really got down to it, you realized that, you know, they're not in the position that you truly thought they were in. So, so I, I love your advice. And I think that there's a, you know, there's a, a, another secret to that, that most people don't necessarily talk about. And that's, you know, you need to understand truly who that person is. And it's great that you, yeah. it sounds like you've been able to latch on to or, or attract people in your life that, you know, truly are the people that you thought they were, and you weren't necessarily blindsided by this, you know, this facade that they were trying to put up. I, I think that I'd love to say that that's hundred percent accurate, but um, no, I, I, I definitely have had the wool pulled over my eyes quite a few times, but um I think that if I look back on it, the the one thing that I did right was almost like that that saying "quick to hire, quick to fire." You know, yeah. I'm not very good at that in, as as a boss, but I I have been good at that about the people that I I thought I looked up to of realizing that they're not who I thought they were. I mean, I had a boss once that um, spent a lot of money, and it was all that was like you said, it was a facade. It, it was, he was struggling in life, but nobody really knew that from the outside. And the only way that I realized that is that he, we were going out to dinner one night with clients and we went back to his apartment so that he can change. And I was, you know, already downtown uh, Manhattan. So I went up to his apartment for a drink, but you go in his apartment, there's zero furniture. There's mm -hmm. like nothing. It's like, um, you know, Ferrari, but they don't have the gas to, yeah. to put in the tank. Right. It's just sitting in right. front of the house. I felt that when I went up there. Um, so I, I kind of challenged him and realized that like he had a lot of issues. Um, and I've had other people over the, the, the life that I looked up to that, you know, you go on a work trip with, with people and that's when you really get to know them and you see how they interact with um, people of the other sex and, and they're married and wearing wedding bands yeah. and things like that. And it, it's something that you, you've got to look at because the world of, your reputation matters, matters more now than ever. Obviously yeah. I'm on a podcast with you right now and hopefully lots of people will see this, but there's Instagram, there's LinkedIn, there's all of these media channels and all it takes is for you to align yourself with the wrong guy or girl for everybody to realize that, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're probably not who they think they are. And I, I want to make sure that the people that I associate with in my friends group and, and work life are, are those, those people that people always look up to. So, yeah. 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 No, couldn't, couldn't agree. I, I've had my, I've had the wool pulled over my eyes. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's interesting. Like, I, you know, that's something that most people didn't necessarily, I, I don't know, maybe it's even supposed to be common knowledge, but I didn't necessarily catch on to that. Like, you know, if they're showing it must be, you know, must yeah. be true. And I, you know, obviously yeah. some people are, are better at covering that up than others. So, yeah. um, yeah. you know, you, that, that's, that's not a knock on you, Matt. That's a knock on them. That, that must mean that they are uh, a seriously, uh, they got a lot of issues that they're so good at lying and so good at yep. hiding that yep. they can fool even, even the best of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, no, at any rate. Um, so, so, have you been to China, actually? I've, I'm curious. I've been to China quite a few times. Yeah. Um, yes, I've been to China quite a few times. Yeah. Speaking I've, about the wool pull over your eyes, is that is that what made you think? No, of, no, no, uh, no. I, I, it just shot me back. Cause, so I've been to China a couple of times too. We 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 do some importing as well. And um, any any crazy stories or anything from your your Chinese trips? Like, what's any anything come to mind? Like, I can't believe we did yeah. that or had to eat that or whatever it was. I've been to, to China maybe about 10 times, um, mainly in Southern China. Obviously, Hong Kong is amazing. Hong Kong yeah. is like New York. Um, exactly. A lot of exactly. expats, a lot of English speaking, you know, like-minded entrepreneurs are there. It's a really fun city. But when you go actually into Guangzhou, Shenzhen, some of these smaller yeah. China, uh, China um, cities in China, it becomes very, very challenging to find um, people that you can really trust and, mm -hmm. and having relationships is more important than anything when it's another language. Um, and yeah, you know, they're, they're an entrepreneurial country and, you know, they're, they're really have been growing obviously over the last 10, 20 years, but um, it's, it's been interesting because I've, I've been in positions or at dinners with people where I didn't know if it was the actual factory boss and some of the salespeople, or if it was yeah. just like, the trading company's brother, sister, mother, whoever, just sitting around the table pretending to be, yeah, this factor. I didn't know if you went into a factory and you look at the 
the showroom if these are the actual products that they made or if like your products being made down down the road so yeah. my my first my first real experience was that was walking into a factory and realizing that like this employee brought me to a factory line half people aren't even wearing t-shirts in here they're no eye mask and they're doing some soldering this is not a factory that we should be working with but if i go back to the states i'm not going to be here to tell you that so how yeah. do i ensure that we are we are abiding by fla standards we are abiding by cpsa requirements and we are like actually sourcing responsibly and the one way that we can do that is by third party auditing every single factory we work with mm -hmm. we can third party test every product that we put out so we really have a really good relationship with the Intertech and SGS of the world. And every product that we put out has a testing report. And every product that we have has a QC report because quality control is also very important. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times these products are ending up in maybe children's hands. Um, they're definitely going to California, which has got a lot of, a lot of um, tough regulations. Sure. And so we, uh, we third party test everything, but the QC is our own QC. We made sure to hire staff on the ground in China. They send us um, QC reports throughout. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one way, not just to have good product, but also speed up the production line. You know, a lot of times these factories in China will get your order. I might not be a big client to them, but yeah. L'Oreal for sure is a big client to them. Yeah. And if my products on the, the, the product, the production line and L'Oreal gives them a purchase order, they're going to take mine off and put L'Oreal's yep. on yep. by having those boots in the ground uh, ensures that that doesn't happen to our clients, that we are able to speed up production. We're able to stay on the production line and the product that you order will be the product you want. Um, and then of course, the sourcing from China, as you probably know, has gotten so much more challenging yeah. over the years Absolutely. with, you know, the tariffs that Trump put in place and, you know, beyond that now with the, the COVID crisis and the shipping crisis the shipping, that we're in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's that's crazy. When you Do you often um, launch new products or source new products? Or is it, is it do, you, or do you pretty well have a good, obviously you have a good product line, but how often are you going outside of that product line to find something new? It's very rare that we ever put out the same product. Ever. I mean, it's always, it, I'm not saying that we're always doing a different water bottle every time, but it always has a different imprint or a different PMS or Pantone color. Yeah. Every event that we work on is completely different. We could work on uh, a campaign for Anheuser Busch that's launching a new seltzer line and they want to have an amazing influencer mailer that's never been seen before. Or we can have a, a special liquor rack display for a unique shaped bottle that we have to fit within mm -hmm. the legal laws of how much a, a rack can be. Yeah. Um, so it's always, it's always challenging, but by having that creative team, a production team that really understands components and can fit it in budget has been really helpful, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely hard being a CEO these days. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I didn't realize you guys did such, such a, a, I mean, obviously I knew that you did custom work, but um, yeah. that's great that you're, you know, basically every piece is, is completely unique. So yeah. um, any, any challenges that you've found with, um, uh, I, I guess, I, I guess, what is the design process? Are you, are you guys getting, you know, sending over the, the uh, design drawings, then you're getting a sample made and you go to the client, hey, tweak this to change that. Okay, get another sample. And now let's go to production. Is that basically the, the process? Yes. You just dumbed it down. Thank you. That was, yeah. that was great. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, our, our, our biggest challenge on that side is that there's always an enhanced date that's fixed because there's always an event. Yeah. It's always the last thought of thing is that like, oh crap, we need something to give out or something yeah. to give away or something to sell. So we don't always have the luxury of time. At the same time, the client wants the most creative product that yeah. fits within budget. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we like to take over as much of the creative process as possible and design and if there's just not enough time we'll do something domestically we'll we'll still have an illustrator on our team or a copywriter create something unique um get something domestically turn around in some cases in 24 hours and ship it out yeah very cool yeah. very cool wait are, do you pretty well work in all uh you know all verticals all different industries now at this point we work in a lot of different substrates and materials. There's very rarely anything we can not do. Um, there's some things that we won't do. Um, 
And there's definitely companies that we've said no to, to working with that don't align with our B Corp interest. You know, that's yeah. one of also the good things and the challenging things is that we want to work with companies that do well in the world, that put out better for you products, that take care of their employees and, mm-hmm. and, and give back. Uh, there's some companies that don't care about that and we don't want to work with those companies. We'll pleasantly say no or refer them somewhere else. But you know, the Sephora's of the world that took a 15% pledge uh, the Unilevers of the world that are making an impact with social change. Those are the companies that we want to work with and feel that it what it's what inspires our team. Our employees are excited about it. And, and uh, I think that we can, we can grow with just that. We don't need to work with every single client out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. What, what's next for you guys? Do you have anything that, that you guys are working on right now? Yes. Uh, I mentioned it's very hard being a CEO these days. We're working from home these days. Uh, We have a beautiful office in New York City that one or two people go to. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, we have no plans to return back to the office anytime soon. Instead, we want to look forward to enhancing the experience of our team members at home by um, adding more value to them that's going to just impact their daily life, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also we need to collaborate more as a team and feel a sense of community as we're hiring more team members. So hard joining a company when you're working from home, it's really hard being trained working from home. So we're looking at um, doing different retreats and getting people on trips together, um, you know, some sort of team building exercises and really feeling like this is a family more than anything. Yeah. Uh, Making sure that people have space that the challenge definitely is that, and people have always asked me over the past like six months, especially, hey, do you feel like your employees are like less productive working at home? I'm like, no, my employees, unfortunately, are, are too productive, like overly productive to a fault. And I feel bad because I don't want somebody to get burnt out. Yeah, I don't want somebody to affect their mental health because they wake up in the morning and they're working until they go to sleep. They don't have yeah. that commute and they don't have that lunch break. And they can't run to the refrigerator kitchen just for a water break uh, and see people and interact. Um, and, it, and it makes it challenging. So I want to make sure that people take the time on their calendars to go for a walk around their neighborhood or, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know, do whatever you have to do to make sure that work is not the only part of your life, but also uh, make sure you get the job done. So, uh, you know, balancing those two. Yeah, I love that. In ter- I love that. And, in terms of what's next for us, um, we had a, an interesting year during COVID. Obviously, we sell T-shirts, water bottles, and things like that. Carnival Cruise Lines and Sephora, I mentioned, are some of our clients. Mm-hmm. Nobody was open from March to maybe August of last year. Mm-hmm. John and I made a pact to each other not to lay anybody off or cut any salaries during this. And you can imagine how expensive it is running a business out of New sure. York with, with that many employees. But we looked at ourselves and said, what can we do? You know, we saw... Everybody was going through this pandemic, working from home. Governor Cuomo uh, was on mm-hmm. TV every day, begging people, if you can get me hand sanitizer, you can get me masks, like whoever can do it, please. We jumped right in. We did it the Harper and Scott way. We put together a catalog um, of hand sanitizer, 62, 70, 80%. Wow. We partnered with domestic factories in the US, uh, took over their production lines and said, whatever you're making, we're just going to buy it. We'll, we'll sell it. We're not worried about that. Just yeah. only work with us. Uh, we tasked our, our, our friends and colleagues in China to find us masks, three-ply mm-hmm. masks, KN95 masks. We didn't want to play in the N95 or um, yeah. the gloves business because there was too much fraud in there. Um, and we ended up being one of New York State's largest suppliers of masks. We delivered wow. hundreds of thousands of hand sanitizer across the country to different organizations, Fortune 500 and large enterprise companies. And that was very impactful for us. A, we kept and retained our employees. We didn't just survive. We thrived during that, luckily. Yeah. We opened up a lot of doors. So about 62 new um, clients happened during that time. Wow. Of, again, Fortune 500 companies that are very hard to get on their vendor list. And mm-hmm. just because we had something they needed, yeah. they immediately put us on their, those vendor lists that we're able to take advantage of now. So uh, there's a few things that we're, we're doing going forward. Um, I, we we're in a place where we have our foot in the door at a lot of big companies. And I really like to focus on just taking care of the clients that we work with. Mm-hmm. There's way mm-hmm. too much growth that we have. If we just focus on what we have and pause any sort of finding new clients at this yeah. point, yeah. Um, I'd rather take care of people we have and, and get that organic growth. And then um, 
how can we take what we have at this core business and, um, and, and find something that we can grow more with. And we realized back in September of last year, you know, again, back to COVID, the, um, the hand sanitizer and mask business became a commodity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't worth anything anymore. And it wasn't our forever business. So we, we immediately got out of it, but again, all these businesses we're working with weren't back operationally yet. And um, we tasked our, our team members, we split them up into eight different pods and said, just create different things, create a new product, create a new category or a revenue stream for Harper and Scott. And somebody designed um, this really cute kids line um, that protected kids going back to school. And we called hmm. it Sidekicks at the time. And we said, Shh, man, we are... We have been designing product for other companies and other yeah. brands for the past seven years. We see, you know, great successful people like Ryan Reynolds with Aviation Gym mm-hmm. or um, Kim Kardashian with Skims and all these great talent and artists doing their own brands, but they're working with, you know, companies that have been around for a while. But we're like, we have everything. We have distribution, yeah. we have mm-hmm. marketing, we have creative, we have production. Let's create our own brands. We'll hire teams around them, we'll build out an incubator. And uh, let's see what we have. So we just launched our first one on Wednesday. Oh, very it was, cool. It's, it's called Dare to Roam. It's with Sierra, who's an incredible, incredible partner. Um, it is an antimicrobial travel and accessory line. So oh, every wow. product is made of high quality Korean fabric, um, but it has an antimicrobial wash that prevents bacteria from growing on it. So you're sending your kid back to school. Yeah, no problem. You have a really beautiful backpack that you're not going to worry about bringing home bacteria on. If you want to travel, I always travel with a backpack. Yeah. Put it on the overhead compartment under the seat in front of you. It's not going to pick up bacteria. That's incredible. Uh, it could be washed. It could be washed 200 times and, and never ruin that. And so the, the, the hero product was the backpack that we just launched, had a very successful launch on Wednesday, uh, thankfully, with a really great team around this brand, Dare to Rum, that we hired. We'll have luggage and other products coming out yeah. around holiday. I love that name too. That's a fantastic name. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun. And Sierra was definitely a part of uh, choosing that name, which is why she's been such a fantastic partner. Um, and so we have a, a few other sort of brands like that that we'll be launching over the next year, year mm-hmm. and a half mm-hmm. um, and continue building teams around. But exciting that the, the growth will hopefully continue and hopefully continue making a positive impact on the team members we have at Harper and Scott and the clients we work with. I love it. Yeah. This has been, this has been a really, really great conversation. Um, you, you've, you've, I mean, you've obviously been able to pivot. You uh, you just, you just did it last year. And then, you know, out of that, you, you spawn this whole other, um, you know, business outlet for yourself. So I, I absolutely love that. So, you know, kudos to you. That's a fantastic job for kind of keeping your head on a swivel and, you know, doing what you need yeah. to do when you need to do it. And then realizing that, Hey, we've got something else here. So. That, thank you. The only thing I would say is that we don't, we don't necessarily call it a pivot. Um, we, we didn't change any sort of business model. We've just yeah. been really great at sourcing product um, and, and figuring out how to take our core business and create different revenue streams from. So I wouldn't say it was, it was a pivot necessarily, just uh, an opportunity to create different streams of revenue for the company in terms of growth. And hopefully we can continue doing that. Uh, yeah. But, but it's been, it's been crazy. It's been, I love it's it. been quite a ride. I love it. So, so you, you mentioned before, are you taking on new clients at this point or, or no, you, you, are you, you're, you're kind of just focusing <laughs> on what you have and then, you know, all of these other business avenues that you have going on. I think the ideal, the ideal strategy would be stay with what we have, figure out a way to grow our current clients. Mm -hmm. But if a really great client came that had the same sort of characteristics and and traits that we're looking for and wanted to be great partners with us, not just treat us like a vendor or a supplier, but truly wants us to be there as a part of their team, then we would definitely welcome it. Um, But it's not something we're seeking out, of course. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. So, so I guess with that being said, if someone feels like they might fit into that category, what would be the best rate, way to reach out to you or get in touch with the company? I am extremely hands-on. Um, I love to be a part of those those calls, so they can reach out directly to me. Um, email me directly is is probably the best way of getting in touch with us. People have found other ways, when sliding into our DMs on Instagram, or yeah, you know, sending us notes on LinkedIn. 
um, which is how we get some of the biggest accounts we have actually randomly. People <laughs> link, LinkedIn message us, but, but email is definitely the best way. And we'll make sure to be just as fast as the response for me as it would be if you were already a client of ours. So yeah, love yeah. it. I love it. Michael, this has been fantastic. Again, thank you for being on the show. And uh, I, I, I wish you nothing but success. I know there's going to be nothing but success there. It's, you've got a great platform, a great, great uh, mind. So again, congratulations. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me on. It sounds all great. Uh, the anxiety seven and a half years <laughs> later is still just as real, if not more today than it was yep. seven and a half years ago. But it'll always be there. I, I, I appreciate talking about this and it's still inspiring and almost feels like we barely scratched the surface still. Yeah. No, that, thanks, that's, thanks that's, for having me on. That's what it's all about, right? You, know, you got to keep moving. Yeah. What's, you know, what's the, what's the next thing that can, you know, yeah. sort of scratch that itch that you have to, to continue creating. So yeah. Um, yeah. Love it. Love it. Again, Michael, many thanks. Thanks, Matt.